That was wonderful. Isn't it nice to have someone uh, so talented to be able to, to break that awkward silence? That's just wonderful. Good morning, yada, yada, yada. If you are joining us as a guest or first time visitor, either here or online, you are welcome to leave your contact information in the chat, in the chat so that way we can get to know you. If you are here first for uh, first time, please come visit us uh, after we'll have coffee and conversation. Now, I invite all of us to greet one another. People online, if you are muted your audio or video, please take a moment to unmute so that way we can say hi once again. Wow, look at everybody. Hi, people. Hi, Hello. people. Hello. 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 Good morning, Hello. everyone. Hello. Good, Good to, to see everybody in now. person <laughs> or on Zoom. That's great. I'm not welcome. Welcome. Oh, yes. Good to see y'all. It is so good to see everyone here today. Morning. Oh, it's not on. Hi there. How's it? Laura and Wendy. Hi, Anne. Hi, Diane. <laughs> there's, there's Patrick. Hi, everyone. Oh, there's there's, there's there Laura. Hi, Laura. Anne. There's there. there. no. the COVID crew here. Well, COVID COVID. <laughs> Not me. I'm okay. Yes, sir. I'm okay. All too. right. All right. All right. I just couldn't get dressed this morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Reverend Doug Tusker, and I'm the minister here at the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Fredericksburg. I um, am not on video, so here I am. Yay! <laughs> I uh, can't be with you today. I had an emergency, a medical emergency, that required me to come to Atlanta but I am with you virtually. I'm here in Mexico. Um, I don't know if there's any way to remove that, but I will power through. Our invitation today comes from Bob Boston. He writes, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. supported the Supreme Court's decision striking down government-sponsored prayer in public schools. King was asked about this issue during a January 1965 interview with Alex Hill. He said, I endorse it. I think it was correct. Contrary to what many have said, the decision sought to outlaw neither prayer nor belief in God. In a pluralistic society such as ours, who is to determine what prayer shall be spoken, where, and by whom? Legally, constitutionally, or otherwise, the state certainly has no such right. In one of his most famous passages, King reminded Americans of the different roles that religion and government play in society. The church must be reminded that it is not the master or the servant of the state, but rather the conscience of the, of the state. King observed in a sermon, religion must be the guide and the critic of the state and never its duty. If the church not recapture its prophetic zeal, it will become a relevant social club without moral or spiritual authority. Come, let us worship together.
Please join me in reading our chalice lighting words, which are found on the screen. <laughs> we, the people, shall not be told to which religion we must belong. Sorry. We, the people, it's that, it's that important, it's old, to which religion we must belong. We can exchange ideas and beliefs because we have the freedom of speech. We light this chalice because we are guaranteed the right to exercise our faith as we wish. Hi, my name's Ed Rodriguez. I'll be your song leader today. Our opening hymn is found in the gray hymnal. Please rise, embody your spirit. Number 113, where is our holy church? It's, it's time for that, right? Okay. Hi, and welcome to Wonderbox Time. I think Reverend Doug is going to join us. And Reverend Doug, unfortunately, oh no, we have some children. Would you care to join us on the, the rug? Thank you. All right, so I know Reverend Doug is going to be telling us a story, and I will let Reverend Doug tell me when to open the box. Hello, friend, welcome. Hi, everyone. Oh, it's good to see you. Yes, Chris, why don't you invite someone to open the box and see what is inside? And what are those things that you found? You found papers. What's interesting about those papers? Are they all the same color? No, they're all different colors. And there's my favorite color, red and purple. And there is Margaret's favorite colors, red and purple, Reverend Doug. Wow. What, do my, what do we notice about these colors? We have red, orange, yellow, green, Blue. What do we notice about these? Rainbow. 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 Yes, we found some rainbow papers in the Wonder Box, Reverend Doug. Thank you, Margaret. Do you want to sit back down? That Thank you, friend. Wonderful. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Chris. I have a story that I'd like to share. <clears throat> Once there was a very colorful kingdom with a beloved king who treated all his subjects with dignity and respect. All the different villages had a favorite color. Many of the houses and buildings were painted in their favorite color. There was the yellow town near the river, 
the green town next to the forest, a red village at the base. Rut row. All right, are we able to get Reverend Doug back? Uh oh, let's see what happens. I guess. I think I'm back. Yay, welcome back. Good to see you. I don't know where I left off. Well, you were telling us about the different villages. There was a yellow village and a green village. And I think, I think that's the last village we heard about, right? Oh, we heard about the red village. Thank you, friends. Well, thank you. There was a main town near the castle that was mostly blue. And every year, the towns got together and held a week-long rainbow festival. Ooh. As the years went by, the king grew old. He got very sick, and it looked like he might die. A mean prince who lived in the blue town convinced the king that he was the best one to run things until the king got better. But once in charge, the prince declared that blue would be the color and the only color of the kingdom, and huh. all the buildings could only be painted blue. He sent his knights and guards to make sure that all the villages changed their colors to blue. If any town refused, the prince had the mayor of the, of the town thrown in jail. The people were very unhappy, but they feared the prince's army. Then one day it rained, but the sun stayed out. And before long, you could see a rainbow. Oh, it like rained this. with the sun out for a whole week. And every day, there was a huge rainbow that could be seen throughout the kingdom. The people took it as a sign that they were meant to have all the colors of the rainbow in the kingdom. The people gathered together along the main road that connected all the villages, and they marched on the castle. They wore clothes in their old colors, and they carried colorful banners. They formed a beautiful rainbow on the road. There were so many people that they overwhelmed the army. The soldiers laid down their weapons, and they joined the march. When the people got close to the castle, the, princes saw them coming. the prince saw them coming, and he got on his horse, and he fled. And just then, the king appeared, wearing a multicolored robe and a crown with jewels, representing the colors of all the villages. He had recovered from his illness, and he came out to see his people. Everyone cheered as they mixed together in full color. The king met with his advisors and he passed a decree that the kingdom would never be allowed to favor one color over another. And that everyone was free to pick their favorite color, no matter which village they lived in. The crowds went back home and everyone painted their houses as they saw them but they kept the Rainbow Festival as a reminder of the freedom that they enjoyed. Yay, thank you. Well done. All right, so we're gonna take our rainbow, Reverend Doug. Thank you so much for that story, and I think Reverend Doug is gonna talk a little bit more about that sort of thing to the grown-ups, but we're gonna head off to class. So if we could put the words on the screen, hey, we are going to head off to the classroom. Okay, you ready, Margaret? Awesome, here we go, everybody. You've got the light of love within you. Go on your way in peace. 
So let your light shine, the world awaits you. They're gone already. Go on your way in peace. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Take a breath, beloveds. My name is Roddy Bell Shelton Biggs. My pronouns are they, them. I serve as your intone minister. Take another breath, beloveds, as you arrive here and now, whether that is here in person or joining us online. You may choose to close your eyes Focus a gaze soft on the flame, maybe the eyes of your neighbor, whatever that is, know that you chose to be here with us this morning. Maybe you plant your feet firmly on the floor. Maybe at home you're curled up in a ball covered up by a blanket with a pet in your lap. Wherever, whatever that looks like, may it be a sacred and holy space this morning. May it be a space where we know that we are invited, where we know that we have a place where we can talk about hard things, where we can know we are loved. Take another breath, beloveds. Settle in and arrive. John F. Kennedy wrote this. I believe in an America where the separation of church and state is absolute, where no Catholic prelate would tell the president, should be he Catholic, how to act, and no Protestant minister would tell his parishioners for whom to vote, where no church or church school is granted any public funds or political preference and where no man is denied public office merely because his religion differs from the president who might appoint him or the people who might elect him. I believe in an America that is officially neither Catholic, Protestant, nor Jewish, where no public official either requests or accepts instructions on public policy from the Pope, the National Council of Churches, or any other existential source where no religious body seeks to impose its will directly or indirectly upon the general populace or the public acts of its officials, and where religious liberty is so indivisible that an act against one church is treated as an act against all. Hello, everyone, again. We talked with the children about the freedom to choose one's color. Today, we will be talking about balancing church and state in a fluid society. I want to thank Fred McCoy for winning the auction and asking me to talk about separation of church and state and religious liberty. Thank you, Fred. And I also want to point out that 
I will be using the word state and government interchangeably and church and religion or religious organization interchangeably. Because I know we're a fellowship and not a church. So I just want to make that clear. When I was little, religion was a central aspect of my daily life. My family to the Catholic Church on Sunday. I went to Catholic school during the week. My best friends in the neighborhood also went to my church and my school. Religious symbols were all over our house, and we did rituals like praying before meals and bedtime. I just assumed that everyone did these things and that we were all alike. But somewhere along the way, I began to sense that my family's faith wasn't the only one out there. As my circle of friends expanded into other areas, like my little league or YMCA, I began to be exposed to religious differences. And then in the late 1960s, things started to heat up in Ireland between the Catholics and the Protestants. Before long, the two sides were boiled in an all-out civil war. My father traces his paternal heritage to the town of Ennis Killen in the county from Monmouth. Through the vagaries of history, this predominantly Catholic town found itself 10 miles on the wrong side of the border in predominantly Protestant Northern Ireland. So I grew up feeling some connection to my people who were under occupation by the British. I didn't know anything about the atrocities and the acts of terrorism on both sides. It was simply a case of us versus them. Without really knowing what they were fighting for, I chose sides merely on the basis of my religion. The Catholics and the Protestants weren't really arguing about theology. But of course, religion, politics, and culture are intertwined. Religion became an easy marker for their differences, overshadowing deeper conflicts regarding land, wealth, and privilege. There is nothing new or an and this is not an isolated case. It's been going on through history. Our Unitarian forebearers in Europe during the time of the Reformation knew all too well what it was like to be persecuted on the basis of one's religion. They were burned at the stake, and whole villages of Unitarians were slaughtered throughout Poland and Transylvania. It would be easy for me to exploit that history to build up our identity as a persecuted people, us versus them. But I want to lift up instead our history of tolerance. Tolerance is the first step in acceptance of difference. There's a long way between tolerance and unity, but tolerance is a necessary step along the journey to one homes. Tolerance is a recognition that folks can coexist, cooperate, and even be civil despite differences. It sounds like a simple idea, right? But it's not always what we do. Particularly when we want to be in control or if we fear that we are losing control of power. Tolerance means letting others live the way they want to live or to believe what they want to believe as long as they're not hurting anyone else. Now, it doesn't mean we have to buy into their perspective or to join them, but it does require us to step back and let them make their own choices. In 1568, in the middle of the Protestant Reformation, Unitarian forebearers Michael Servetus and Francis Lee dared to question core Christian doctrine. 
Now, David was a priest in the Reformed Church, and he was also the court preacher for King John Sigismund I of Transylvania. No creedal standards had yet been set for the new Reformed Church, so when David preached against the concept of the Trinity, it caused a huge controversy, and it even threatened to divide the country. King John convened a council in which David, David rather, eloquently defended the proposed decree of toleration. Following a unanimous vote, the king issued the Act of Religious Tolerance and Freedom of Conscience, also known as the Edict of Porta. Now here's a translation of what it said. We affirm that in every place the preacher shall preach and explain the gospel, each according to his own understanding of it. And if the congregation likes it, fine. And if not, no one shall compel them, for their souls would not be satisfied. But they shall be permitted to keep a preacher whose teaching they approve. Therefore, none of the bishops or others shall abuse the preachers. No one shall be reviled for his religion by any. And it is not permitted that anyone should threaten anyone else by imprisonment or removal of his post or his teaching. For faith is a gift of God and that comes from hearing the word of God. Before long, theological debates became all the rage across the kingdom. Things sometimes got testy, but it was always left up to the individual in the audience to decide for themselves who they sided with. Over time, the king rejected the idea of the Trinity and declared himself a Unitarian. In 1571, Unitarianism was formally recognized as one of the country's recognized religions. Unfortunately, King John died shortly thereafter and things unraveled under his successor. Francis Dudley was in prison for his preaching and he died in his cell. Religious tolerance was so innovative that it took several centuries before it would take hold again. But nonetheless, a historical first had been achieved by the Unitarians, one that we could be proud of. In the ensuing years, of, as the Reformation splintered into numerous sects espousing different beliefs, religious wars and persecution were rampant in Europe. In this atmosphere of religious turbulence, philosopher John Locke in 1689 wrote his famous paper called On Tolerance, in which he established the principles of religious freedom. Now his main concern was illegitimate use of force, including violence, in the name of religion. Locke's position was that no person or group has the right to force another to belong to a particular faith or even to have one. Locke believed that God gave every person liberty as a natural right. The highest expression of that liberty is to choose for oneself how to best care for one's soul. In other words, faith is a matter between an individual's conscience and God. Religious tolerance is imperative because the only true spiritual path must be chosen and believed by the individual through an inward judgment. Faith can be shown through teachings, rational persuasion, and lived examples, but ultimately, every person must take a stand for their own beliefs for it to be true in their own heart. Here in this fellowship, we boldly proclaim religious freedom as one of the hallmarks of our mission. We require no one to hold a particular theological position to worship with us or to be a member of this congregation. 
We recognize that sitting side by side in our pews at this very moment is a variety of beliefs about humanity, divinity, and the mysterious forces of the universe. Religious freedom doesn't mean we have to keep our faith to ourselves and never speak about religion in polite society. On the contrary, talking about our spiritual paths as we explore the mysteries together is wonderful. Spiritual interchange is one of the main ways that we make sense of our place in the world. By sharing, listening to one another, we move beyond tolerance into understanding, acceptance, and mutual love. Faith is a commitment derived from awareness, discourse, and inward judgment. One may come to believe that their inward knowing is highly probable, but they can never be certain. As religious liberals, we interject reason to measure the degree of probability of what we believe. One can say that we always leave the door open for new insights. Religious evil, on the other hand, results from misguided reasoning that conflates probable judgment with absolute certainty. Locke pointed out that throughout history, those who turned religious zeal into force did so when they had the power of the civil authorities on their side. However, when they lost their government backing, they conveniently became proponents of toleration. Locke's solution was to keep the church and the state separate. The civil government or state exists to protect each citizen's civil interests and to promote the outward prosperity of society. These are the concerns of the temporal world and material well-being. We consent to be governed by civil authorities whose duty it is to execute laws equally and impartially, no matter our difference. A religious community, on the other hand, is a voluntary organization that people join to publicly worship in a manner that each person judges to be spiritually acceptable. The church's power rests on articles of faith or covenants, which members consent to follow. If someone can't submit to those conditions, they are free to leave. It is beyond the authority of the church to use force to deny civil interests or worldly goods in the enforcement of their rules. No religion should be allowed to imprison or fine someone for violating one of their precepts. And it is beyond the authority of the state to meddle in the affairs of the church or to base laws on any particular religious creedal beliefs. John Locke's ideas were picked up by Thomas Jefferson and incorporated into the Virginia Statute on Religious Freedom right there where you are in Fredericksburg. They also influenced the establishment clause of the U.S. Constitution, which states, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting free exercise thereof. That's it. Plain, simple. Well, not really. What's going on now in response to changes in society regarding marriage equality and reproductive issues is a flipping of a religious freedom on its head. Certain religiously conservative groups who dis disagree with certain laws are advocating that they be allowed to deny civil commerce on the grounds of religious freedom. They claim that their religion provides them from, or excuse me, that their religion forbids them 
from engaging in certain lawful behavior. So therefore, they are justified in refusing to sell products or provide services to people who do engage in that lawful behavior. Their reasoning is that by transacting with these people, they would be violating their own self-prescribed prohibitions. Using their language, they would be complicit in sin. In effect, they are using their interpretations of religious freedom to be intolerant. Religious freedom, as articulated by Francis David, John Locke, and Thomas Jefferson, gives no one the right to discriminate against people in civil space because they disagree in religious space or to use their religion as a tool of oppression and force. Now, 2022 was a devastating year for religious freedom. The Supreme Court, in several controversial decisions, abandoned long-standing doctrines that have supported the principles of no establishment that ensure our government stays neutral when it comes to religion. In Carson versus Macon, the court ruled in favor of using state money to fund a religious private school in Maine as a proxy for public school in a rural area. In Kennedy versus Bremerton School District, the court allowed a football coach to lead prayer on school grounds with his player after a football game. And in June, the court overturned 50 years of established law when it overturned Roe versus Wade and about abolished the right to have an abortion immediately. 16 states enacted laws prohibiting abortion based on extreme religious interpretation of the beginning of personhood. Now, some might think that me taking a stand against these laws from the pulpit is a violation of separation of church and state. Separation of church and state does not nullify religious influence on social policy, in fact, not being part of the state enables the church to be free to criticize the government on moral grounds. But there must be a balance of the secular and the religious in a pluralistic society that is constantly changing. Social and religious issues clearly intersect because our faith calls us to live our religious values in society. In fact, the most prominent characteristic of liberal religion, like Unitarian Universalism, is our intentional engagement with modern culture. Sulak Sivaraska, co-founder of the International Association of Engaged Buddhists writes, politics without religion is blind religion without politics is simply inconsequential. As religious people, we have a prophetic imperative to speak in the public square against excesses of power that harm us and others. We are free to use our pulpit to criticize, support, and mobilize action for causes that are consistent with our values. Like the call to march in Selma back in 1965, it is entirely open for our fellowship to espouse the inherent worth and dignity of all people when advocating for LGBTQ students, or to stand in solidarity with our Jewish and Islamic neighbors because we value acceptance of one another, or to protest the environmental degradation of our planet out of respect for the interdependent web of all life. Compassion, empathy, and moral justice exist at the intersection 
of the religious and civic life. As Unitarian Universalists, we have a rich history of religious tolerance, spiritual freedom, and standing on the side of love. We can embrace difference, navigate disagreement, and lovingly be in conflict without succumbing to an us versus them othering of our fellow human beings. Let us listen to our conscience, uphold the human dignity of everyone, and help build a just society as a testament to our faith. That is what it means to be religious and to be free. May it be so. Amen. I'd like to give the opportunity now for anyone who is on Zoom or in the um, fellowship right now to take a few moments to share anything that they would like to reflect with everyone, anything that has come up during the worship. If you are in the fellowship, someone will bring uh, a microphone. While we're waiting for that to happen, anybody on Zoom, if you would like to share something, just uh, unmute your mic and speak. Okay, well, thank you everyone. During the offertory, you are invited to come forward and silently place a, pub a pebble into the bowl of water for any joys and concerns that you are holding in your heart. If you are online, we encourage you to donate via text message or by visiting our website and using the online donation form on our home page. We will post the text number and link in the chat and on the screen. Greeters will also be coming around with a basket for in-person donations.
May all that has been shared and freely given here help us to grow in generosity and caring for the world of which we are a part. Our closing words come from Richard Children. Not to speak publicly, not to engage in the political sphere, would be to create a power vacuum into which other groups with or without a transcending vision would step. Thus, the religious community as a voluntary association not only has a right, but an obligation to engage in the struggles of a pluralistic society. Go in peace, serve with them, and return again in love. Our closing hymn is number one in the gray hymnal. May nothing evil cross this door. Stand as you're willing and able, and we will be singing all four verses this time. Join me in reading in unison our words for extinguishing the chalice found on the screen. We extinguish this chalice, but not the light of love and service. May it be a catalyst for spiritual growth and social justice as we carry it outside these walls to the world we live in until we are together again. <laughs> 